Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Isn't it great to be in a theater again? This is like the first time in many, many months. So uh, with snakes, though, that could be a little bit of a, uh, a challenge, I guess. But uh, snakes on a plane, I'd never seen the movie before, so this is new to me. And it's great to be here. It's really great to be here. A little bit about myself. Uh, I loved reptiles ever since I was knee-high. I lived in a city of Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, where there was a lot of strippings, like coal banks, and a lot of rocks, and we had a lot of snakes the non-venomous ones, but we had our share, and I remember many, many childhood memories of bringing these back home and getting them loose in the house, not in the airplane, right, but in the house, and uh, a lot of problems with my mom and sisters, but uh, I think every child probably experienced that once in their life with a pet that they brought home from the wild. Uh, I studied snakes. I served on a lot of technical committees for the snakes of Pennsylvania. Uh, timber rattlesnake dense site assessment program. That's a lot of words where we would uh, research every known timber rattlesnake dense site in northeastern Pennsylvania. We had to go to these areas high up in the mountains and find the rattlesnakes, find the dense site, uh, assess it, pick up the rattlesnakes, see if they're boys and girls, which I'll probably talk about, and scan them to see if they have a little transponder in their body cavity, and if not, we had to put one in. So I had a lot, a lot of experience with venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes. I uh, served on the first reptile and amphibian survey called the Herpetological Atlas back in this, probably the 90s it was. And I was one of the state's leading contributors. So I had a passion for reptiles and amphibians, even at this stage, at a stage of my life. I uh, adjunct at Keystone College and I teach herpetology throughout the seasons, not in the winter, but usually in the springtime, where I have a lot of fun searching for reptiles and amphibians as well. And some of you might recognize me that we did quite a bit of TV shows on Pennsylvania outdoor life where we would do reptiles and amphibian surveys or we would visit a timber rattlesnake den site and talk about it and the science of it and why they're important, why they're rare, and uh, many other snakes as well of Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. So after this movie, which I'm excited to see, uh, I have a short PowerPoint, and I always like to add education involved with my PowerPoints. I want to get back, give you something back, but I want you to learn something as well, and also share your knowledge, and I'm sure afterwards you're going to share the stories that you had as well of some fearfulness of snakes, or maybe you loved them ever since you were a little, little child. Or, like Erica right now, you might touch one, right? Yeah, yeah so we might have a first timer here. And uh, afterwards, after the PowerPoint, I did bring three of my favorites. And uh, two you might be able to touch and hold, and the third one we won't hold, but we'll get up close and personal with it. Its name is Justin Timbersnake, so I think you know what it is, right? So without further ado, let's see this great movie and have fun. And I said if someone's wig wiggling your popcorn bag, it may, I'll check my lids and let me know, and we'll see if it's uh, one of mine. I hope not. But have fun. I heard thousands of stories why people are fearful of snakes. And I thought I heard it all, and I probably could share some of those stories with you, but is anybody afraid of snakes or your first encounter of uh, why you are scared or you're not no longer? But anybody have any experiences with snakes that frightened you at one time or the other in the past, future? What's yours? If you're right, actually, just like, are you afraid of your brother? Your brother probably bites, right, at one time. How about your big dog, right? Sure, all animals could bite, and humans as well, right? And kids especially. Uh, yeah, snakes bite, and I handle a lot. And a lot of us probably did handle snakes, and I'm all, I always expect to be bitten by a snake. Even if I think it's the most harmless snakes, like the smooth green snakes, there's always that chance that they might bite. It's just a stranger danger. And some, you're probably guaranteed to be bitten by, like northern water snakes and maybe a black racer. Uh, any snake stories about how, uh, scared or you know people who are scared of snakes or seem like to me the, the the most common one is that the the element of surprise and if you're walking around in the forest uh on a highway a lot of nature i lead nature hikes every day of my life with lar large groups of people and many of them have never seen a snake before other ones are fearful of snakes and i love when somebody's fearful of snakes because they find them and we've been walking a trail and the ones who don't like snakes they're always looking or they're just like attracted like the pheromones that, that you saw in that movie I think that they're attracted to them and just joking around, but they do find them. And it's like the element of surprise. You look and they're very cryptic and camouflaged, so you can't see them. A uh, little bit better. Uh, I heard that one of the war stories was uh, as a child, as a child, a, a lady uh, talked to me about why she's so fearful of snakes. And she said her brothers play, had played a, a very horrible trick on her, a prank. Uh, they caught a snake and they pushed her into their, her bedroom and it was at nighttime, 
threw her in the bedroom, shut the lights off, and tossed a snake in, and shut the door. And she said she was like she was almost sweating when I did a snake show at the Columbia Mall many years ago with Pennsylvania Outdoor Life, and she couldn't even walk by. She was breaking out in a cold sweat. I think that was like it was cruel, but it was like one of the worst situations I ever heard of. Uh, of people why they're so fearful of snakes. Uh, anybody else want to share any stories at all? Of, Uh, the way to, uh, what I saw, there's a couple of uh, snakes that were non-venomous. You know, I saw a corn snake. Uh, snakes usually don't attack you. They use that venom for, what do you think they use the venom for? There's two reasons. Uh, well, yeah, warning off, right? It could be a, like, leave me alone strike or, yeah, self-defense. And also, to, uh, most of the venom, what do they use venom in nature? To kill. Right to capture, their, to mobilize their prey, and they usually these venomous snakes are pretty large. There's some narrow, s small ones as well, but they uh, are usually uh, attacking or, or hunting, if you will, uh, warm-blooded animals, birds and mammals, maybe much larger than them, and so they need something powerful to uh, strike it, and then the venom will activate inside their bloodstream, and either it's a neurotoxin or a hematoxin, or it destroys blood tissue, and then they could kill us. Uh, Pot, they could uh, attempt to eat it, like that guy was getting his whole head eaten by that anaconda, right? That was really bizarre, and it, it doesn't happen that fast. And so, uh, also, some of the hematoxins, like in a timber rattlesnake, northern copperhead, it's actually almost like a meat tenderizer as well. It's breaking down proteins, and it's easier for the animal to digest. Now, when they don't want to eat, they're not—they're going to save that venom for a meal. Uh, I have northern copperhead. I have timber rattlesnakes for for over 20 years. And I usually feed them mousicles. You know what mousicles are, kids? I usually buy the food frozen and already thawed, and I feed them, I warm it, and I have to maybe mimic that it's alive and warm-blooded. So I have to heat it with warm water, and I dangle it in front of the, the rattlesnake or copperhead. Then it'll strike it, release venom, and then I'll eat it. Uh, sometimes I'll eat if it's not necessarily cold, but maybe this room, room temperature. Once in a while, after they awaken from their kind of their torpor, even though they're in captivity, but by photo periods, they know that October, November, they don't eat for me. They'll remain, uh, won't eat from maybe from October all the way to April in captivity. It can be 80 degrees inside those aquariums. Uh, wild animals, they, they still mimic the wild patterns of, of their natural behaviors. And I could put a live mouse in what my timber rattlesnake and they'll sleep together. It's like the weirdest thing in the world. This is safe, because it, it knows that it's not a threat and it won't, it's not hungry, and it's going to save that venom. And they also have with the venomous snakes, what they have to detect warm-blooded warm animals is that they have a heat-sensing organ. Now, you see that green in the movie? That was not really what they would see or sense. With the, it's called a laurel pit. It's right between the nostril and the eye. And I do have a timber rattlesnake, and you probably could see that when I uh, have it on display in an aquarium. And they could detect if it's a lot big threat or if it's a little chipmunk or, or white-footed mouse, and they know. So any time that they see a big animal, they're going to say, that I'm not going to eat that, and they're going to give you a defensive strike. But however, that defensive strike might be enough that you might get medded back to a hospital. Uh, can it kill you? Rattlesnake venom and copperhead venom? Perhaps, very rarely, but you're going to have a really bad reaction to it. You might have some disfigurement. You might lose a finger. You know, I always say good snake handlers or venomous snakes are the safe ones. Count your fingers. Uh, the Indiana Jones show-offs usually have a problem. Uh, there are situations if it bites an artery or vein, it might possibly cause a fatality. Uh, there are some cases of that, but most of the time you might recover. You should recover. And so they need that to, uh, their venom, they're going to save that for, for hunting. And that's what they really, really rely on. And if I ever, you know, my, my snakes that I take care of every day, every day, every day, you think they get used to you? Some do. And some they can smell, and they know that it's feeding time or handling time. But the timber rattlesnake and the northern copperheads, uh, they're always looking for a battle. And it's like, you know, the aggressiveness of them, like when you see that on the movie, uh, they're coming after you. Not necessarily, but if it knows it's in a contained area, that snake will come after me. Sometimes it strikes the cage. And even though I feed it every day, take care of it, or feed it when I need to and take care of it, uh, that one you can never pet. <laughs> never, never, never. You can never be friends with them. Uh, the other snakes they habituate were, you know, from handling to get used to you, to get used to your smells. Uh, but they do know it's feeding time, and once in a while I'll be feeding them, and they might strike at the food that I'm putting in and might bite me, but they're not doing it a defensive bite. It's more about that they missed a target. And I do have a couple snakes I'll show you. 
And we have 14 species of snakes that are native to northeastern Pennsylvania. Can we name some? I think there's a couple snake experts here. Let's name a couple of them. Let's name the non-venomous ones first, okay? The green, smooth green snake, one of our most harmless snakes, uh, kind of rare in northeastern Pennsylvania. What's another one? Eastern garter snake. Eastern garter snake, one of the most common snakes found in this about every type of habitat, uh, from backyards to gardens, why they're called garden snakes, to the highest ridges where you will see timber rattlesnakes up in the mountains, and you'll see them up there. Another one. Northern water snake, and that one, if you hold, you're going to get a little, maybe get tagged by it, meaning uh, they don't, they like to be left alone. They like social distancing. What we're accustomed to now, they're a social distance snake, northern water snake. What else? Black racer, another one that I don't even keep in captivity. Black racers are all energy. They're always on the move, and really, really, uh, they don't do well if you have a permit or a submission license to keep one. Uh, so I just maybe keep one for a couple days for a show. Uh, high strung, really high strung, and uh, uh, probably they, they call it the land shark of snakes because they're always on the hunt. Another one. Another black one. Eastern, you know a lot, uh, eastern milk snake, which is one that has a lot of patterns on its back almost chestnut colored, and actually have one, so you might be able to hold that one. So it's misidentified as a northern copperhead because of the copper saddles, if you will, markings on it, on its body. It's a long, narrow snake, though. Uh, black rat snake, and it, many in the Wyoming Valley, Wyoming County, along the Susquehanna River, and they're arboreal, meaning that they're tree climbers. They could climb just about any surface, from telephone poles to telephone lines to trees, and they hunt up in trees. And there was some research done on black rat snakes where they're up several months in the summertime up in trees, never come down. And they hunt squirrels, chipmunks, and birds. And bird eggs, they'll eat. Uh, okay, what else? We have a couple more. How about the two venomous snakes, which are in this region? Okay, rattlesnake. Diamondbacks are in different parts of the, uh, of the country, absolutely right. So we have one. In this region, it's called the timber rattlesnake. Knox and rattlesnake roundup, right? Very world famous. And we also have the northern copperhead, which is more uncommon. It's more of a southern snake, but they're found along the Susquehanna River corridor. And we're missing a few. There's a couple other non-venomous smaller snakes. Anybody in the back, do you know any of your snakes? Uh, we always think that there's water moccasins. If we traveled, called Uber and traveled 400 miles south, would you become a water moccasin? There's snakes that most of the time, water, northern water snakes are misidentified as water moccasins. But we have two others, one with the scientific species name, Contortrix moccasin, which is the northern copperhead. So it has the word moccasin after it. It's a stout, chunky snake. And also uh, puff adders, or uh, they call them moccasins, as well as uh, eastern hognose snake, which are uncommon. And they're really uh, phenomenal actors. They're a harmless snake, but they look like a rattlesnake, look like a copperhead in a sense. They hiss and sounds like a rattlesnake, but the hissing noise they make, they can flatten their bodies out and have this triangle-shaped head, and if that doesn't work, they play dead. And they can roll on their backs, and they'll stay that way for 20 minutes or more. Another one? Yeah, this is, and they're very rare. They're uncommon, eastern hognose sticks. Yeah, well, you're not supposed to own them, though. I know they tread. So uh, the, all of the snakes that I'm talking about, every one of your, your reptiles and amphibians in Pennsylvania is, is managed by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And you, yes, you are allowed to keep one of certain species, not two, but this one, but you need a Pennsylvania fishing license. And other ones, you might need a, a special permit, either a scientific collector's permit or a, a timber rattlesnake permit or a northern copperhead permit. So they are, they are protected and regulated. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And so also we have a couple other non-venomous snakes. We have the smaller ones. What's that? Corn snakes, that's a cousin of a milk snake, but they're not even in our state. They're more southwest of here in adjoining states, West Virginia, and they're also down in the, the Jersey area and south. So corn snakes. But there was one on the movie that was hunting, which would never do on those people, the passengers. And so we have a couple other. They're really small, and sometimes you don't see them. Uh, Northern brown snake, one of the first snakes I ever found as a child. They called that the city snake. If you go to Philadelphia, you probably find a northern brown snake. And they're all brown, 12, 13 inches, harmless snake. They eat slugs and earthworms. And you have a cousin, if you go up to Ricketts Glen State Park in the higher elevations, 
you have a beautiful snake called the northern red-bellied snake. It's brown on top and a beautiful scarlet red belly. And it's a cousin of the northern brown snake, another harmless snake. And what separates the two is elevation, where they live. Uh, bottom lands and higher elevation, the northern red belly snakes. Also, uh, one of the most secretive, but common as well, it's very skinny, it's long, it's dark, it has a yellow belly and a ring around its neck. I just said the name. A northern ring neck snake. And it's a salamander slug snail specialist. That's what it eats. Long, skinny snake, 20 inches, smooth to touch. So it's, it's a very harmless snake as well. Very common, but you don't often see them. They're called fossorial, where they're under rocks and foraging and hunting those animals that hide under the rocks, especially salamanders. And I think we have maybe one more that's very, very, very rare. And if you go along the Delaware River in Monroe County and maybe uh, Wayne County in the sandy soils, it's called an eastern warm snake. An eastern warm snake is one that's truly underground, hunts earthworms and other animals, insects and bugs. And this one, it's, uh, it's almost so slippery, it's a scale, it's a reptile, but if, it has such a strong, stout neck because it burrows under the sand hunting. And literally, if you find one and hold it in your hands, it has a kind of a wedge-shaped nose, and it'll peel through your fingers. You, you could hold it as tight as you could, and it'll work its way through its fingers and get out of it. It's like a burrower. And they're very, very rare and hard to find. Some people who look for them after a heavy, heavy, heavy rain, when the soils are saturated, they might come a little bit closer to the surface. So did we leave any out? I think that was about 12, 13, northern copper, timber rattlesnake, again, red belly snake, northern brown. I think we got them all. I think we got them all. And my stories, uh, I handled a lot of snakes and I was never scared of them, but there's a couple times where I was, quote, by observation of others that I was scared. And I'm gonna share a couple stories and one was kind of recent as well. Uh, one of the first stories was doing a Pennsylvania Outdoor Life episode and we went to a rat timber rattlesnake den site. And I was doing some research as well during the show. And I don't wear the right PPE. We have the chaps, snake chaps are sometimes called. And I didn't wear them because I wanted to convey to the audience, if you're walking in areas where you think there are snakes, venomous snakes, just be aware of your surroundings. Never run if you see a snake because you might run on one. So you want to watch where you step. And we were going to the den sites and filming them. And this was a birthing area where there was a lot of females. Uh, Thermoregulating, meaning warming up in the, su in the sunshine because they're developing their embryos inside their bodies. And the cameraman, Brian Hollingshead, was taking videos of a lot. And I, have, I was on this slide presentation. And there was about eight or nine rattlesnakes in the rocks sunning themselves. And I was watching him as he was really up close. And the photographers would know how close you have to get to some of these snakes to get close-up shots. And he was doing that. So I had to be aware of where he was stepping. And when I was doing that, I looked down and a rattlesnake crawled right across my sneaker crossed my sneaker and didn't bite me. Uh, why? I have no idea. I would have been bit and it came out of a rock and I was careful but I was focusing on him and not myself. And more blooded creature expelling a lot of body heat and this thing just crawled right over my sneaker. So that was one of my closest calls. Another time I was with a famous naturalist who was part of the Northeastern uh, Timber Rattlesnake Den Site Assessment Program, John Sorrell. He is now in Florida finding snakes in Florida. He retired. One of my best friends and a phenomenal snake person. And he was part of the, the research team. And we're climbing a cliff edge. And I'm climbing up the cliff edge. And he was behind me. We're going to a known den site with GPSs. And we're you know, looking for rattlesnakes. And as soon as I reached, and this one it was not almost vertical, I stuck my head up and eye to eye with a timber rattlesnake. It was only about a foot away from my face. And I thought I was going to get bit in the neck and fall down 20 feet and die. And I just backed up and stepped down. and. My, John said that was the first time he ever saw me scared of anything in nature, and I did. I was really scared of that, and I just count my blessings that uh, I wasn't bitten in the neck or the face. I would have been in the worst situation. Maybe not the snake bite, the venom would killed me, but the fall would have. And most recently, most recently, this was, uh, I, my wife Wendy's in the audience, and I almost wished her goodbye. And I'm driving home from work. I had a snake program that was uh, uh, at nighttime. It was, uh, actually, I think it was this program that we were doing in November, wasn't it, Erica? And Yeah. And so I have this container, and I have another container, the same two containers, and they're screw-on lids. So in the one container, I had a black rat snake, and the other container, I had a timber rattlesnake. And I was going to, from one area where I have my snakes on display, and I was going to drive to, the, to Dietrich here for a presentation. 
uh, the next following day. And I'm, nighttime is about 7, 8 o'clock at night. I'm driving down Interstate 84, and I'm driving down the highway, pitch black, and I feel something touching my ear. I look and I go, oh my gosh, it's one of the two snakes. I said, I'm going to die and crash or I'm going to survive. And I didn't know if it was the timber rattlesnake or the black rat snake that escaped from my lid. First time in my life, I must have was in a hurry and I cross-threaded the lid and one of them got out. And so I pressed my hands-free dial. I couldn't see which one it was. I told my wife, Wendy, I said, honey, there's a snake in the car. I'm driving on the highway. I couldn't pull over at the moment. And I said, it's either the rattlesnake or the black rat snake. And I had pulled over finally. I couldn't find which one it was. I found out it was the black rat snake. And I said, oh my gosh, I survived. And I pulled over to a gas station, couldn't find it. I said, okay, I'm going to probably go home, park it in the garage, leave the doors open, and it'll crawl out. And I just won't have that uh, education animal anymore. And so it was scary. And so uh, driving down the highway, talking to her, said it was the black rat snake. I said, Wendy, it was the black rat snake. I'm driving down the highway, and here it wraps around the steering wheel. That was a good feeling, though. So I grabbed the snake, and I pulled over, and I put it in the bucket. And again, well, I was in a hurry, and I make sure these are really, really contained now. So it was a cross thread of that. So there were my three stories. And I think one more I'm going to admit that I was uh, in my early, early show-off day, and a gentleman who is no longer with us now, uh, a physician, had a timber rattlesnake den site on his property, so he said. And uh, I went up to the den site with him and his wife, and she was a veterinarian. And we were up there, and we found rattlesnakes. And I saw one that was going under a rock, and I went to pull it. And I pulled it quickly, many, many years ago, stupid mistake. As soon as I pulled it out of the rock by the tail, I wanted to see, show them the colors, and it struck me. And I said, whoa, that was close. And the physician, both of them are physicians, he goes, you were bitten by that rattlesnake, they're checking me out. And for some reason, the snake missed my hand. And we were about maybe a mile away from the nearest his house, and then I would have been a, pro would have been a problem. It was a really stupid mistake when I was, I, was, I, was, I was in my early 20s when that happened. And I'll never do that again. That was an Indiana Jones move, and uh, it was a terrible thing to do. Uh, anytime now that I have permits, we have to use the tool. Uh, at that time, you know, I wasn't doing any research. We were just being a stupid youngster at the time. But um, you have to use the right PPE. It's called these snake tongs when we handle venomous snakes. For research for any time, if you have one, if you're going to get a permit to look for one, uh, use the tools or use the snake hook. Don't try to pin them down and grab them by the neck or try to free tail them. They could bite at any angle. A couple years ago, a person was bitten by a northern copperhead in Luzerne County. I think he had a little bit too much alcohol and he picked one up like the Indiana Jones. He was bitten three times as he was holding it this way, three times in the arm. So they could kind of angle and swing and bite you any way they, have, they could. So any stories to share at all? Oh, sure. And you saw that in the TV show, right? I mean, in, the, in our movie, right, with they're wrapping around those big constrictors. They're called constrictors. And we have a couple snakes that are constrictors. We have the black rat snake, which is a constrictor, and the eastern milk snake. So we have two constrictors. And that's a method, that's an adaptation to how they could also eat big prey. They don't have venom. What they do, they have lots of rows of sharp teeth. They grab the animal. It could be by the foot, it could be by the back. And they have immediately really quick reflexes where they wrap around and constrict. Every time the animal exhales, they squeeze tighter. Every time the animal exhales, they squeeze tighter so it cannot breed any longer. It suffocates then they could safely eat it. Now, how does a snake eat such a big animal without choking? Or how do they fit it in their mouth? They could expand that way. We do, too. Ever see people at buffets? That's... But how do they first get it into their mouth without using any hands? All snakes could do this, and some are masters at it. Right, they could unhinge their lower jaw. So not it doesn't go wide, but it goes long. It goes downward, and so they could almost swallow something, consume something almost three times the, the width of their head. It's amazing to see that. Some, the rattlesnake I have could eat a gray squirrel. When you see the look at the head, they say, wow, the milk snake I'm going to show you, that eats large mice, large mice. And that head is so small. It's amazing that they can do that. So constrictors, that's the strategy for the, how they hunt. And they could constrict. And there's other ones, eastern garter snake, northern water snake. They eat their things alive. And they'll grab a frog. They have lots of rows of sharp teeth for holding. 
and they just start swallowing. And it's a bad debt for the toad, the frog, or the salamander. It's an awful way to go. I think if you're um, killed with venom as a, as a prey item, I think that's an easier way, right? And I think even being constricted is, is kind of an awful way to go. And uh, that's methods. And snakes are very important in nature. They're, they're, they're pest controls, they're animal controllers, and also what animals might eat snakes. Owls, absolutely. Birds, fox, right? A mink, raccoons, right, as well. So there's several animals, especially birds. Some birds are really, really great snake hunters, like red-shouldered hawks and broad-winged hawks. So they're, they hunt snakes as well. Even venomous snakes they'll try to capture. And also, some snakes eat snakes. Uh, there's two types. The black racer eats snakes, and the eastern milk snake will eat snakes. So one time I did a show, I had an eastern milk snake in a container. I had another snake, a northern brown. And I come back, I wouldn't just present the two. I took the milk snake out. I was looking for the brown snake, and it was consumed by the eastern milk snake on the way to a show. So I have to live and learn of those mistakes, right? Yeah. So where did it go, right? Where did it go? And one time, one time I found, we're looking for snakes, and we found an eastern milk snake died. It was dead, but it had a big, smooth green snake halfway in its body. And so it kind of bit a meal that was a little bit too big for it to, to swallow, and both of them died. So one would die by eating the other one. So strange things in nature, right? So if you want to see some snakes, I'll put the timber rattles. Any questions first before I take some out? And we're going to have to social distance. We're going to uh, put your mask on if you want to touch one, or I'll talk about it a little bit first. And then at the very end, we're going to come this way if you want to see up close and personal. And I'll put the timber rattlesnake on an aquarium right over here. I think Erica's going to put some lights on, maybe. And you can get a good look at a timber rattlesnake. What I want you to look for is the rattle. I want you to look at the eyes. How do we know it's venomous as opposed to non-venomous? Very triangle shape, right. Absolutely. What other ways? Yeah, absolutely right. So the, at least on the northern copperhead and the timber rattlesnake, the eyes are elliptical, like a cat eye. While non-venomous snakes, their eyes are human-shaped, round pupils. Now, that we have to get really close to see that. So sometimes it might be too close, right? The third way is hold one and see what happens. It's like in the movie, right? So, but guess what? Guess what, though? They might have a dry bite. So a venomous snake could uh, control the amount of venom. They could inject venom from both fangs, and it could be a dry bite. And, and some people that are bitten by a timber rattlesnake in the southwest or the southeast, where they have a lot of uh, these snake roundups, they think they're immune to rattlesnake venom, and they become these snake worshipers. And that's not the case. Eventually, it's going to happen to them, and they're going to have a reaction. That probably was from a dry bite. So any other? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the aquarium up first. And I'll take uh, probably the smaller one out first, and then I'll take the big black rat, rat snake out that I have. So give me a moment. We have to put the mask on. They not, rattlesnakes don't often rattle. You could be at a den site, and some will rattle when they feel that they're threatened. Other times they don't. They use their cryptic pattern to, to remain uh, unnoticed, and it's very uh, remarkable how that could happen in the woods. Or if they feel threatened from a far distance, you might hear them from 30 feet away. Now, snakes really can hear, but they feel vibrations. But they have good sight for movement as well. And so that's a black-faced timber rattlesnake. And it's rattling right now. So I'm going to take out another snake. I'm going to get my mask on. And how do you tell the age of a rattlesnake? Do you count the rattles, the segments of the rattle? <laughs> it's usually by the length and the size, but every time they shed their skin, they produce a segment, a button of that rattle. So maybe you might see a rattlesnake that has four rattles, a little quiet buzz. You might see one that has 16 rattles on it with a loud, loud buzz. But they break off in dense sites, you'll find rattles all over the place. They snap off. It's almost like maybe what your fingernail is, keratin. And it's amazing. You could have a rattle, that one that you found, and shake it. You can't shake it that fast to make that rattle sound of what they could do. So it's amazing this, the, how fast their body motion, the muscle contractions are on them to make that buzzing noise. But also non-native snakes, non-venomous snakes could rattle as well. Black rat snakes and black racers are especially in dry, dry leaves. They make a buzz, and it sounds almost like a rattle, too, as well. 
I can't yell at him to stop saying, stop that jet. So inside here I have a harmless, beautiful snake. I had her for years, about 40 inches long. So this is an eastern milk snake. And you notice I didn't grab it by the head, and I never do. There's no reason to. If you have to grab a snake by the head, you're, you're going to expect to be bitten by it. So I kind of make tree branches, and I let it just hang. Some snakes are afraid of heights. Other ones will slither down, but the eastern milk snake's pretty good. It just likes to cl It's not a climbing snake, but it'll stay motionless, or it might crawl around on your hands. So if you want to come up and touch it or feel it. Now, reptiles and amphibians, what's the difference? How do we know a reptile from an amphibian? What separates the two? Water? Do we agree with this gentleman? Most of it's water? No. So is a sea turtle, is that a reptile or amphibian? Water snakes, right, okay. So some snakes frequent water, eastern ribbon snakes and, nor and northern water snakes. Other ones are more in dry habitats. So what's the difference between the two? It's an old bio lesson. What, what's on the skin of a snake? Scales. What's on the skin of a slippery frog? Slippery skin. So that's one way. How about the turtle? Is that a reptile or an amphibian? Because the shell is all scales, hard scales, right? Even the legs, the head. Also, how about a lizard? Lizard, is that a reptile or an amphibian? What's Lizards are dry and scaly, right? And how about a salamander? Amphibian. So what's the word amphibian? What does that mean? Easy way to remember this. What's a baby frog called? Tapple. What happens? It metamorphs into a frog. When a turtle hatches from an egg, what does it look like? Baby turtle, right? So the word amphibian means two lives. So from an aquatic environment, usually they lay their eggs in water, it looks like a tadpole or a baby salamander, it looks like a long tadpole, and then it metamorphs into a salamander or a frog or a toad. And while snakes, turtles, and lizards, they have dry, leathery eggs that usually they lay their eggs on land. And so when they hatch, they look like a baby lizard, baby snake, baby turtle. So that's the difference. And this one has scales, but it's going to feel slippery. So this has really smooth, unridged type of scales. Anybody single file want to come up and hold or you want to touch? And we'll work with you. What do you want to do? You want to touch first? Or do you want to hold? You want to hold? Okay, so, oh, so after you're done, we have hand wipes, or hand wipes, so you can wash if you want to. So I want you to hold your hands up like this. I want we go this way so you can take a look. And don't open your mouth. I'm glad you have a mask on because that usually comes out your mouth and up through your ears. Now, in the movie, they were going right at you, and they wanted to eat you, right? Could that snake eat you? Absolutely not, right? What is it doing? It's just exploring right now. The tickles. <laughs> Good job. So what kind of snake did you hold? Eastern milk snake. How about you, young man? Good and great with your questions and answers. And separate your hands a little wider, like a big collapse. This one wants to actually crawl inside the hoods. Is it? Yeah. Uh, how about wild ones? Do you have pet snakes or do you have wild ones? Wild. Wild? Yeah. Garter snakes probably, right? What else? Um, I've caught one racial snake. I've also had my um, meetings with copperheads before, too. Hopefully very careful, right? From a distance, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to hear that otherwise unless you have that tool, okay? But you have to have a reason to pick up venomous snakes, and I think your, mo your mom and dad will not like that, right? Yeah. Good job. Anybody else want to hold the milk snake? Absolutely. So big fingers. Does it feel slippery? Like slick, yeah, right? Yeah. Very slick, right? These are common snakes found. In, is everybody from Wyoming County? They're very common, but they're kind of secretive. You'll find these along ag lands, along the Susquehanna River. You'll find these up in the high mountain, rocky ridges as well. So they're kind of a really wide ranging. They can eat snakes and they eat rodents, so, and, and maybe small birds. He's, he's scared of it. He's scared of frogs, so he just wants to touch it. That's what we do. We're going to do one at a time, okay? One at a time, and then 
<laughs> okay. So this is a constrictor. So if that was an animal that wanted to a mouse, it's going to bite it and wrap around that mouse about four or five times, coils. It's amazing what they could do in that little head can eat the largest mouse. Good job. Yeah. Oh, I feel, I feel a strength now. He's like, once you start pulling away, he like really like... There you go, young man. Yeah, just give him some fingers and some branches and he's going to start finding your arm as a platform. Even though they're not tree climbers, they have tremendous balance. Unfortunately, the milk snake, it has those kind of coppery colored patterns on its back. And they've been killed, persecuted, many, many, for many, many years. People think that they're copperheads. So they're not. They have a non-triangle shaped head and they have a pattern on their head. While copperheads going to have a solid copper colored head. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very strong. They're deceivingly strong, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so you can, you can wash your hands, too. Anybody else? Erica? Yeah. She has, I, we have a question. Good. Okay. Yeah, they can just move in a lot of different directions. Without legs and arms, right? Isn't that amazing? After about eight years, she's finally going to hold one on these programs. <laughs> Fingers up. There you go. Is it windy outside? You're shaking. <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. Just let it go wherever it wants to. Where's Omar to see this, right? I know. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> way to go, Eric. Anybody else before I put it back? We're good? I'll take out another one now. Well, let's make sure I put this lid on correctly. Right? That little bit of a gap, and it was able to work its way through. That was amazing. Now this one, I want to hopefully settle it down and I'll see how it behaves before we could hold, but we'll definitely touch it. Its name is Blackie. And Blackie, come on, I don't like how it's... Oh, it opened its mouth on me, that wasn't good. So Blackie's a black rat snake, and this is kind of a one that I haven't had in captivity for only about three, four months now. And so this one probably I'll let you touch, but I want to control the, the dangerous end, meaning this has a big mouth with a lot of sharp teeth. And once in a while, remember De Erica a couple of years ago at the Tunkhannock River Fest program, a bolt of lightning happened and thunder. And I had a black rat snake, and it bit me in the leg because it heard the thunder and it got scared right in front of everybody. Snap. That's another snake story. <laughs> so black rat snake. This is not full grown. These are the largest snakes in Pennsylvania. These will grow up to seven feet long and probably as fat as my arm. And they're phenomenal tree climbers, egg layers. They lay about 35, 40 eggs. So they have other ones have their inside their body cavity. So black rat snakes, you see a lot at Howland's Vosburg along the Susquehanna, the bottomlands along the Susquehanna River. Big snake like this likes the sun, likes to heat up. You'll see these on roads. That's a long bodied snake and unfortunately cars might accidentally or hopefully not intentionally hit them. So you might see some uh, succumb to automobiles. You know, that happens every so often because they're, you know, they want the warmth of the road, especially in the early mornings. The road will heat up faster, but it's a long, long snake, powerful tree climber. It feels like I'm getting my blood pressure taken right now. That's a hard it's squeezing me, but it wants to hold on. Just like the movie, right in the airplane, right? That was so crazy, wasn't it? They're coming right at there and they're leaping and jumping and they're holding on. Usually a venomous snake, when it bites you, it injects the venom and it leads, lets go so quickly. It doesn't hang on there, like did it, but that's all for Hollywood. So it was a, it was a good movie. You kept first time you didn't fall asleep. <laughs> Anybody want to touch Blackie? All right, so let's, how about you help me unwind her? You could take her off me.
pull her off hard. There you go. Look how strong she is. I don't want to pull her too hard. Okay, so I'm going to hold Whoa. this in. Whoa. Pretty big, right? Yeah. <laughs> Slithery, right? Uh-oh, we got a problem here. She wants to go for a walk with you, right? Not bad. She's just holding on to this part of her strong tail that she's on a branch right now. Your arm's a big tree branch, and she just wants to get her balance. That's all, right? That's all she's doing. She's not hungry for you at all. She'll never even do that, right? There you go. I think she likes to rest on necks and shoulders. Want to put it around your neck and shoulder? No? Okay. It's worth a shot. Right? Now, have you ever seen these where you live? Yeah. My, my dad went for an, um, carried one down to my house, like seven foot long. That's a big one, yeah. That's a huge one. Pretty heavy bodied, right? Yeah. yeah. Was it pretty tame? No, it was wild, but it didn't hurt or nothing. Yeah. I've been bitten by this one and accidentally, I was dangling a, a dead chipmunk in the container in the aquarium and it grabbed my arm. Big, big marks it leaves, so it's pretty impressive. Strong jaws and unfortunately, and it's just a reaction, if you're bitten by a snake, these types of non-venomous snakes, the first thing you do is pull backwards, don't you? It's just an instinct and guess what happens? You have lots of cuts and scratches, right? So the thing to do is, and that takes a lot of, lot of thinking and, and reactive patience is this let it bite you then it releases it's going up my shirt no yes no yeah you want it on your shoulders you want a double wrap here nope doesn't want a double wrap there you go then <laughs> this is about going for you know five six it's probably about six feet long yeah yeah Lots of room to grow. This thing could easily eat a squirrel. <laughs> okay, they're there. Yeah. And black racers are equally as long, yeah. uh, but they're usually fast. And these are a little more slower when they slither. And uh, black ra ra racers are tremendously quick. I just thought it was like a pipe slider. Yeah. I made yeah. a joke. I was like, wow, look at that. Yeah, yeah, this is over six feet, it looks, or close to it, yeah. <laughs> and these are egg layers as well. Um, so, again, 30 eggs or more. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No? All right, so let's go play with a rattlesnake. So what do we know about timber rattlesnakes? Who ever seen a timber rattlesnake in the wild? We're up in Knoxon area or Oh yeah, up in the northwestern part of the state there's a large population of them exactly. Bad story I want to share with you. I don't want to scare you, but it could happen. Uh, several years ago in northwestern Pennsylvania, northwestern Pennsylvania, and I talked to the physician actually in one of my nature hikes this year uh, who treated, or almost treated that person, but he told him what happened was a guy was reaching for firewood at a cabin, and there was a rattlesnake that he didn't know was in the wood pile, and it bit him, and it hit a, hit a vein. And he died, had a cardiac arrest, going to the hospital. So that can happen. It can happen. It's not that not common, but it could happen. Otherwise, you know, most people, especially with a northern copperhead, you'll recover. So this is how much, how, what kind of health you are in, where it had bitten you, if it's near a vein, or if uh, how much venom as well, and how you react to the venom. So he always wants to get out. Yeah, but you could have a little lock on that. Timber rattlesnake. So, not the largest, right? And it's a safe cage, so you could touch the top and all. Why isn't it striking me, right? So it knows already, it habituated that 
you can't detect my body heat, but if I stuck my hand in there, I could guarantee I'll be going on a helicopter ride to a hospital. Right, so, and it's coiled up, they could strike about three times, almost two thirds the length of their body. So they could strike in a laying down position or they could strike when they're coiled. Okay, it's not gonna, can't really, can't really, doesn't, it feels threatened, but it can't detect what it's gonna strike at. Uh, every so often I have an open screen cage, it might strike. But this one, the cage is contained, and if you want to come up and look at it carefully uh, and see if you can see the heat sensing organ called the laurel pit between its nostril and its eye. It's a little dark in here now, but see if you can see the elliptical pupil as well. It might come towards you a little bit. And once in a while when they feel body heat, I'm going to blow on top of the cage right on its head. So it felt that warm air, and that was a threat to it. And see how it's reacting now? It's ready to strike. Let's say that wasn't from a mouse. This big, big, big body odor that really, really confused it, and it's now it's rattling and it's threatened. In the wild, they can live about 25 years. In captivity, uh, probably add another 10 years to that. Uh, 66 feet long, maybe. The largest I ever measured was close to 70 inches at the Knox and Rattlesnake Roundup. Uh, there were some reports of some that are over six feet, which is very rare nowadays, but uh, uh, maybe because, you know, they're persecuted. You know, nobody wants a timber rattlesnake in their yard or too close to home because they're venomous. You know, there's ways that you could remove them with a, carefully with a garbage can, empty garbage can, and carefully in a, in a, with a lid on it and take it to a secure lid, and not like the lids that I have, right? and take it to an area or call one of the agencies, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, and they might be able to assist you with that. But uh, uh, they are rare. Uh, they're not common. They're very common in some areas, but throughout what they used to be known, no longer. So they are protected. Moms give birth. Uh, since my last permit, which was, I don't know, years now, seven years maybe, this one, yeah, about seven years. Uh, they, uh, mom will give birth every two years. It takes about seven, eight years before they're sexually mature. So they have about three times in their life to have young. And the young don't even look like the, ma like the adults. They're gray. And they almost look like a baby rat snake, a baby black racer. It looks like a, a baby, a young or neonate or juvenile, if you will, uh, eastern hognose snakes. They look like a lot of non-venomous snakes and they have one little button and they try to rattle it and it doesn't make any noise. And, but they do have these elliptical pupils. Yes, sir. Yes, and that's critical to them. So what happens is uh, they use these ancestral dead sites that generations before them for th since the last glacier for thousands of years. And it could be a little opening in a rock that has just the right depth that they 50 some degrees beneath and humidity so they don't desiccate or dry. So they have these perfect chambers for them to withstand the cold winters of the Poconos and, uh, and Wyoming Mountain, Wyoming County and, and this region. And so at birth, the females, they, it's called the gestation area where all the females, they gather before they give birth and they have these near the den. It's not really right at the den, but it could be near the den, maybe 100 meters away or even further, but it has to be a big sunny, rocky area. Once they give birth in August, they'll have anywhere from maybe six to 13 babies, if you will. And it's critical for those young ones, they stay with the parent, even though there's no maternal care, she's not protecting them but they need to follow her scent trail to that winter den. If they don't do that, they're gonna be in trouble. They might not live. So it's critical for them. But then they have this amazing recall where they follow, they can venture up to five miles away when they get a little more mature and go back to that same opening miles and miles away so they don't forget. A lot of it has to do with instincts and magnetic navigation from iron oxide crystals in their heads to scent as well. So remarkable animals and you could destroy a den site and take the rattlesnakes and put them to another den site, they're going to leave. They know to go back to that den site. So uh, it's almost like it's almost a, a fruitless, pointless way to relocate them. And very rarely does it happen to they accept the other den. So it's equally important to protect the den as it is the species. And that's what the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission does, is protect known den sites, which was research projects that we were doing for years. And so they could put buffer zones around them. Don't build, build a wind turbine here, but build it over there. And things like gas lines as well to avoid the conflict. So they
try to do the best that they could to avoid that to protect the species. So, but it's a good question, yeah. And other snakes, it's funny that a lot of other snakes will sleep with them in the winter. Black rat snakes, black racers, hognose snakes. And guess what happens when it gets a little warm? The black racers now say, I have a bed and breakfast. So they emerge and if they're warm enough, meaning the temperature warms up, they might eat rattlesnakes coming out of the den. So that's kind of a weird kind of a sleep mate, isn't it? <laughs> they're gonna eat you when you wake up. Neat animals, these are snake tongs. This is what we use to pick them up. You ever use these before? Since you messed with copperheads, right? This is what you wanna mess them. Here, you ever use them? Here. So this one allows you to grab the animal, squeeze it, squeeze your sister's arm. And it's not gonna hurt you. You can squeeze it tight and it doesn't hurt. No. So it provides very little stress and pressure to the animal that you can safely pick it up and get it out of harm's way. But if you're doing what we do for research, we put them in different areas and tubes and we you know, inspect them to see if they're male, female. So they're called snake tongs. And some longer handled ones, some shorter handled ones. You wanna try, wanna touche to your brother? <laughs> Not bad, right? So this is what we use. Your brother's fingers, he bites. <laughs> so this is what we use. So, uh, and also the right protection is they have snake chaps that have long, almost like so you know when you play soccer, shin guards, and that the fangs itself cannot penetrate through that. But uh, again, what I want to emphasize is if you do see a snake, never run because if you think it's a venomous snake, there might be more than one. And you might run on top of a problem instead of walking carefully away and looking where you walk. Uh, it's getting late. Any other questions at all? Well, thank you for bearing with us. And uh, unfortunate about the, the PowerPoint fiasco, but uh, uh, thank Dietrich Theater for your cooperation and for inviting me again this year to uh, share, well, thank these animals. and. Uh, thank you for your knowledge, because you two and some of the youngsters that were in the back are going to be our next stewards of their, our, for wildlife. In other words, so you might, from this program, you might learn some things that you say, yeah, these need to, they're special animals. And maybe you'll sit on top of a township board of commissioners that say, yeah, we want this power line or we don't want this power line here. Oh, you remember about the rattlesnakes and other animals, right, where they're protected. And so... Uh, we're going to pass the torch to you. How about this? We're going to pass the snake tongs to you, right? So I think you're going to do a good job. Thanks for coming and for staying up this late. And crazy movie, isn't it? Don't have any nightmares because all of that is untrue. <laughs> Thank WBRE as well for, for filming this uh, presentation. And I hope to see you again. Thanks. Sir.